You look marvelous, darling. Marvelous. <laughs> If you would, stand up with me, hold your Bibles, your iPhones, iPads up high. Repeat this after me. Say, this is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God, and I boldly confess, my mind is alert, my heart is receptive, and I'll never be the same again. Never, 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 in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, we're so glad you're here. And those of you watching online, let me welcome you again. Thank you for tuning in. Um, it's that time of year again. And um, it's that time where we're all shaking our heads going, how did we get here so rapidly? It's already, we've passed Thanksgiving. And I think Halloween is really giving Thanksgiving a run for its money. Uh, it's amazing how starting about the end of October, we start shifting our thinking to the, the trifecta, the three holidays. And, and I know the church doesn't recognize Halloween per se, but it is a, a holiday, if you will, that is recognized by our society. Whether you believe in it or not or participate is not the issue. The issue is that we do have these three major uh, celebrated times toward the end of the year. And it challenges us. It challenges all of us. And it's the time of year that we're supposed to be having fun. And after Halloween and all the tricks, treats, trunks, treats, however you want to look at it, the church does trunk or treat, trunk and treat, and, you know, secular world, trick or treat. So after we finish that, Thanksgiving has become a little bit, and I don't like this. I'm not saying this to, it's just an opinion. But I don't like the fact that a holiday that's all about giving thanks fades a little bit. And it should be the beginning of a, a wonderful season. And yet a lot of people look and go, you know, I, I'm not sure really what happened to this year. And I'm, I'm less sure of what, what has happened in my life. I don't know how, where it went. I don't know what happened. And, and, and so with that, we begin to be challenged and conflicted to some degree. And it's supposed to be the most awesome time of year. And yet it's the time of year when most suicides happen. And it's because I think people are looking, well, maybe I haven't achieved what I wanted, and the year's almost over, and a lot of bad things or difficult things have happened, and, and start getting a little down. Well, what I want to do is to elevate your thinking a little bit. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, interesting to me that uh, people say, well, you know, I've, I've just lost my peace, and you know, I just don't have peace. Let me say this to us today, that you don't lose peace. We forfeit peace. We give peace away. We give things, we give, we give a part of our soul away because the reality is that we know the Bible says he will keep us in, in perfect peace. How he does that is by us keeping our minds on him, not on everything going on around us, but on him who's working in us to will and to do according to his good pleasure. And, and difficult things happen. And one of the ways that we give shape to our lives and give shape to the world in which we live is by the words that we speak. And this, this time of year is supposed to be very special, but some of you are already thinking about December 25th. It's December 2nd, and you're, you're, you're not even, you don't even, you haven't given two thoughts to December 8th. It, it, just, it just comes and it, it goes. You're already three weeks out. And with that, what are we gonna what are we gonna eat for Christmas? What are we gonna where are we gonna have Christmas? Who's invited to Christmas? What gifts are we gonna and, and so you have bypassed all the wonderful December dates like December third. Thank you. I'm so I'm so insecure that I had to solicit that. Okay, so but at least I'm now old enough and secure enough to admit it. And so we just overlooked all these wonderful days of December. And we're starting to think about, about that one day that we're going to celebrate the birth of Christ. That day that's supposed to be wonderful and joyful. And, and yet we're thinking, I don't know, oh, the relatives are coming. And, and there are just always a few relatives that just, you know, we wish that somehow they didn't have our bloodline. And you can't figure it out. 
And, and you know, I mean, but Jesus himself had, had a Judas. You know what I'm saying. I mean, he kind of set the pattern for us to go, let me tell you how to handle this, all right? And so we, we, we're, we're thinking ahead, and the Bible says don't even give thought to tomorrow. Don't worry about it because tomorrow has enough trouble of its own. And so I had prepared this message some time ago knowing that I was going to be busy, and I, so I sent it, emailed it to our team, and then this morning I'm getting in the car and I'm thinking, I wonder, I wonder how a lack of peace affects our physical health. You see, a lot of the physical problems that we're having in the world today, a lot of the sickness and disease, is not the result of a new germ floating around the universe. It's the result of, of thousands of years of people forfeiting their peace because we don't trust God. And so I, I, I asked Siri. Siri is my new administrative assistant, by the way. <laughs> and I really like her because every time I call on her, she says, what can I do for you, boss? Because that's what I named myself. <laughs> so I'm feeling really good today. So I said, Siri, tell me, what kind of effect does peace have on a person's life? She said, just a moment, boss. I was like, just elevated me. I, I felt a greater anointing. And so I, 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 this is her response, and she says, um, uh, good health. Okay, number one, there were eight things. I'm just going to give you this one. It says, many people are sick. Some are hospitalized because they lacked peace of mind. This peace will give you a rested soul and body. It will keep away worries, stress, depression, high blood pressure, and heart-related diseases. This reminds me of my mother who thought it was her duty to worry over everybody and everything. Unfortunately, she developed high blood pressure and died earlier than she should. We really miss her. The reality is that some of us in this world, and, and those of you who are not this way, I, I kind of wrongly envy you. Uh, I, I've always been a fixer by nature. I can walk in anywhere and I can see things that, that I wish I didn't see and that other people don't see. And some of you are this way, and you're sitting there going, I'm the same way. I freak out if this is, you know, the light's out, the bulb's out. And some of y'all don't even know their light's on. <laughs> you just figure the room is naturally lit. <laughs> you know, we had a light strand. As you can see, it's out right over the third one from the right. <laughs> no, you didn't notice that until I just pointed it out. She's going, oh, this is such a wonderful church, and I'm loving worship. <laughs> There's a light out. Now, don't blame anybody. It was working at rehearsal, so it wasn't our team's fault. It was working. It's not working now. Can you say Satan? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so, <laughs> so there are things like that. And so with that, I have to intentionally go adjust because I will not lose my peace. I will give it to the devil. Here, lights out. Here's Satan. Take it. I had peace until that went wrong. I mean, you know, if, if there's a, you wash your car and then all of a sudden you're, you're, it's just glistening. And I don't know why birds love cars. It's like they fly around looking for something shiny. Oh, look, there's drop a bomb. I, have you ever asked that question? I mean, why can't they just go on the street? And, and so that bothers me. And when it bothers me, guess what? I check in my peace. I, I don't lose it. I give it away. So if you're finding yourself stressed and out of sorts and messed up, you know, you've given away what Jesus died for you to have. I think it's interesting that in the Bible he's called the Prince of Peace. That's not an accident. God said, I want you to know in the world you're going to have trouble and tribulation and if you're not careful, you'll start worrying about the trouble and tribulation. And in doing so, you won't trust me and you will give up your peace. There's so many things today that rob us of the peace that Christ came to give us. He said, I'll give you a peace that passes understanding. In other words, when somebody looks at you in the crisis situation and you have this calm demeanor they will wonder and not understand how you can be that way when everything is upside down. It's because you made a choice. You see, your choice is what produces or should produce a feeling. Your feeling should not produce a choice. 
If you're living your life from the foundation of emotion, you will be a wreck in your life. And emotion is going to be a reflection of how you need to respond. It, it, it gives you the opportunity to say, I choose to not let this emotion go rogue in my life. I'm keeping my mind on Jesus, and when I do, I'll have a perfect peace. Now, let's just think for a moment, because we love Mary and Joseph. And most of the time, when we read Bible stories, we read them with rose-colored glasses. We don't read them as they really were. I mean, let's just think here for a moment. Mary and Joseph, when we think about them, we think, Oh, how wonderful it must have been to be chosen by God. To be the father and the mother of Jesus Christ. What an honor. What a privilege. Really? Mary has to explain to somebody why she is pregnant before marriage. And that, as if that's not bad enough, she has to try to tell them that she was visited by an angel. If there would have been meth in Bible days, they would have sworn that she was on meth. <laughs> Mary's seeing angels. We need to institutionalize her. She's blaming her pregnancy on heaven. We don't read it that way. We read it as Mary, the mother of Christ. She was probably really pretty. We don't know that, but we assume that. Have you ever thought about the possibilities? <laughs> I'm just trying to get us outside today. And here she is. Let's just go with pretty, okay? I don't want to make Jesus mad. <laughs> My mother's gorgeous. What are you doing preaching about an ugly mother? It's beautiful, Jesus. So let's just go with beautiful for a moment. And let's just go with... Yeah, she's betrothed, but eh, she's not married yet. And people, as they do today, they're counting the months. Ah, let's see, when did you get married? Mm. I'm thinking as wonderful as it was to be visited by an angel, that Mary is now conflicted, has to be with, how do I explain this to mom and dad? Furthermore, how do I explain this to Joseph? <laughs> they didn't have cell phones with location finders back then. You just had to believe them. I promise you I wasn't there. I can't... I can't believe that she was completely at peace with this idea. So she responds to the angel, be it done unto me according to your word. In other words, this is not, I mean, I'm, I'm cool because if you're an angel, you really are, and you're from heaven, I probably ought to say okay. So Mary and Joseph find themselves in this situation that we, as Bible readers and believers in this century, find ourselves going, that must have been the most awesome experience to be visited by an angel. Joseph's going, I got picked to be, be the one who raises the Son of God. Really? How do you discipline Jesus? He's in the synagogue at 12 years old. They can't find him. He's a runaway. What do you go to Jesus and say, I'm going to spank you. I don't think so. What do you do with that? Really, huh? What do you do with that? How do you discipline the Son of God? You look to heaven and go, he's your kid. I know this is the most unusual Christmas sermon you've ever heard. but I'm really trying to get us to connect to an emotion that we don't ordinarily attach to two heroes in the Bible. And to think through what they went through for a moment to do 
the will of the Father. We think it was easy. I mean, after all, Mary's carrying Jesus. The birth had to be easy. Mary was probably yawning, going, oh, there's my son. And, you know, <laughs> after all, it was commissioned by God. Surely he took away the labor pains. I don't think so. I think every human emotion that any of us would experience at the thought of having to explain that which is inexplainable, unexplainable, would have to be going, how do I navigate this? How do I keep peace in my life when I cannot explain for one minute, one second, how this happened? Now, here's what I propose, and I'm going to get to the crux of three thoughts in just a moment. But number one, the words that we speak, if we speak what God speaks, those words will be used as tools that will build our lives and construct our future. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You can tell me or try to interpret what you think you believe, but your words will betray you if, in fact, you're saying something different than what you tell me. God spoke, and the entire universe and galaxies came into existence. There are power in words. Life and death is found in the power of the tongue. So when you speak, it's important that you realize that your words are not just expressing an emotion, but they're framing a future. So God himself uses words as tools. Satan uses them as weapons. I hate you. That is a weapon that Satan will use to divide families and people from each other. There's power. And those words sown will either create peace or consternation or conflict in your soul. If I had one desire today in my life that I would be able to control what I say. Mary could have said back to the angel, what are you talking about? Instead, she says, you know. I think I'm going to go with this. It doesn't quite feel right, but I'm going to watch what I say so that I can have peace in my future. So she said, be it done according to me, according to your word. That response was a tool in the hands of God that empowered Mary to fulfill her destiny on earth. Go to Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and expecting a child. So there's difficulty. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Rejection. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to to men on whom his favor rests. Peace was, is, and will always be critical to God. That's why he sent Jesus. He didn't send Jesus just to die on the cross for our sins. He sent him to give us a little bit of heaven here. I was in an Uber last week, and, and I always find it interesting, and maybe you experience the same thing. But when I'm in an Uber or on an airplane, whatever, I oftentimes am asked the question, what do you do? Now, if 
you sell cars, it's probably not that difficult because they'll start talking to you about cars. But when you tell them <laughs> you are a preacher, something new happens. <laughs> there are two things that create unwanted conversations. Religion and politics. I happen to be in the field of religion. At least in the minds of people who don't know what it's like to be a Christ follower. So immediately this guy, yeah, I always try to go, oh, what can I say here? Because this is either going to turn into some kind of counseling session for the next 30 minutes. Or this guy's going to run me off the road into a ditch. So I said, well, you know, I'm a preacher. And he says, oh, well. He said, uh. You know, he said, well, my wife and I don't go to church. I mean, immediately, he's like, start pouring out his soul to me. <laughs> Explaining to me why he is or is not serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So he, yeah, well, you know, but, but uh, you know, a real nice man. He goes, but, you know, I have faith. We have faith. We have, he says, so, here's the thing. We have a baby. And my wife's pregnant. She's going to have another baby. And so he's just explaining to me why he's going to hell in a handbag. Anyway, no, I'm just kidding. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just kidding. I, just explain to me why he doesn't go to church. And I, I looked at him and said, oh, it's okay. You know, I'm trying to help the guy, you know. And, and I said, it's okay. I said, um, you know, I said, you know, heaven is, I mean, uh, church is not what gets you to heaven. I said, here's what church is. Church is a place where we bring a little heaven to earth every week. I said, and you're just missing out on a little heaven here on earth. And you may be shocked when you get there. You may need a tranquilizer after you go through the gate. I don't know. I didn't tell him that. I but I always find it interesting that, you know, Sunday, Sunday is a unique day. It's, 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 it's a unique day. I mean, when's the last time that you heard someone say, on Monday, call the boss and say, oh, my husband and I got into a fight. The kids threw up. The dog messed in the house. I'm not coming to work today. No, that's, that's, that's only Sundays. Oh, my husband and I got in a fight, and the kid threw up. We're not going to church. You never do that to your boss. Monday through Friday must be sacred. That's what I'm talking about. Well, we don't. This guy didn't say, well, I've got my wife's pregnant, and we got one kid, so I'm not driving Uber today. <laughs> no. We're not going to church. Our life is normal Monday through Saturday. But Sunday, hmm. Okay, that, I, that was just a soapbox. So, I just want to say, look, how valuable is joy and peace and how valuable is it to hear a word that lifts you up and gets you excited? How incredible is it that you can walk into a church unlike a theater and not pay $14 for a ticket? And get this incredible worship and word that's going to edify instead of destroy. I think we'll miss Sunday. I used to preach when my kids were little. They'd be, they'd be like vomit on the right shoulder, snot on the left. And Jesus said, Be thou not moved by vomit. Vomit's in the Bible. just want you all to know that. Look in the book of Revelation. There's a lot of stuff in Revelation you hadn't read because it scares you to death. I'd go to church as a kid, and the pastor would say, Turn to Revelation chapter 20. I'd go, Oh, God, can I repent right now? <laughs> Jesus, forgive me. There'd be dragons and all kinds of stuff in there. <laughs> so, we lose our peace. Or we forfeit our peace. So if you forfeit something, you, you lose. But 
it's a choice that we make. So listen to this. Three things I want you to write down. Number one, as we approach this holiday season, December 25th, that you're all freaking out about, we all are all freaking out going, okay, we have the money for the kids. We have, you know, and so there's this loss of peace because I can't give the kids what I used to give them. And you know, now that we have uh, daughters-in-law, sons-in-law, that, that expands. And do, you, do we expand the money? Are, do you all think this way? If you have kids and grandkids and daughters-in-law, sons-in-law, you know, used to when you just had your kids, you knew, hey, I'm going to give each one of you the same thing, like it, lump it, whatever. But now you got all these these daughters-in-law and these sons-in-law and you got grandkids and what do I do and how do I take care of them? You know, I thought about this year. I thought, you know, the reality is that we lose our peace trying to make sure we get everybody the right thing, right? Make sure I, I want them to like it, right? Well, you know, you can tell when somebody doesn't like a gift, right? You can tell. They open it up. Oh, thank you. Do you have a receipt? I don't think it's going to fit. You haven't even looked at the size yet. And all of a sudden, you forfeit your peace. Oh, I got them the wrong thing. They're not happy. You see what I'm saying? And the thought. So I think what you ought to do this year, and this will really elevate the game, is wrap a rock and, and put a nice thing on there. I love you so much. You're amazing. You're an incredible daughter or son. Merry Christmas. And then they, they look at you like, what happened? Then you go get them a gift, and they're really excited. <laughs> it's a perfect way to elevate everything. You went from rock to a flannel shirt. And they liked the flannel all of a sudden because they were getting a rock. <laughs> Keep the peace. Keep the peace. There are ways to keep it. He said, I'll keep you in perfect peace if your mind is stayed on me. And we lose our mind because we're worried about what they're going to like or not like. We're in fear of what they might say or not say, whether they appreciate it or don't appreciate it. So here are the things. Number one, and this would happen in the life of Mary and Joseph. Joseph, had they not done what God said, it would have been greedy. Greed is the first thing that will steal your peace. It says, I don't have enough or I'm not enough. And so it's all about me. Think about this for a moment. Mary didn't even consider herself, really. She, in that moment, in that encounter with that angel, began to think bigger than how is this going to affect me. Her thought was, how is this going to affect the world? You see, you and I are so consumed with the impact or effect of other people's opinion of us or what we are going to do or not do that we lose sight of how our decision could affect the world. Why, I, I, Mary could have said, well, I'm going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be ashamed. I mean, how do I explain this? Well, then that's all about Mary. But we know that Mary was not self-centered or selfish because she didn't even go there. She went, okay, kind of explain this to me. Well, here's what's going to happen. You're going to become pregnant by the Holy Spirit, and, and you're going to conceive. And, and, and the angel's explaining it all to her and say, hey, be it done unto me according to your word. Not like, well, how am I going to tell my mom and dad? See, greed is not just about holding possessions and money and gifts. It's, it's about our thought life being all about us instead of other people. That's greed. So if you want to, to give your peace away, think only about yourself. Think about, just think about you. Instead of thinking about all the people in your life that will be affected by your choice to look outside your... One, one per, person put it this way. Someone has said there are only two kinds of people. Those who are out to make a better place for themselves in the world and those who are out to make the world a better place for everybody else. There's Mary. Second thing is ambition. Not, I don't have enough, but ambition says, I, I need to get more. Since I don't have enough, I need to get more. So now the focus is not even not on people, not even on yourself. It's on what can I accumulate? What can I possess? What can I get? You know, it would be interesting to me if we said, if you come and spend one hour at church, we'll pay you $25 an hour. How many people would show up? 25. There you go. That's what I'm talking about. We did like be standing room only. I just, I just kind of think outside the box every now and then. Maybe it's a little bit of the Red Bull. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I'm thinking, are we so caught up in self and ambition that we're not really thinking about what church does for us? 
You know, I know we've used the excuse, we figured it out. In the old days, preachers scared you to death, thinking that if I don't show up for church on Sunday, I mean, I really wish God would have put in his Bible, I'm, my son will be returning. And, and I can't tell you the exact day, t- date, time, or year, but I can tell you he's coming back on Sunday. I, as a preacher, I would have loved that. Churches would have been full. Oh, we can't miss church. Jesus, when he comes back, he's coming back on Sunday. Not just Sunday, but God said Sunday morning. And some churches are so afraid they have a Sunday night service. Just in fear that maybe he came back, but they, you know, it's delayed. They're in a different time zone. So we got to cover all the time zones. So we're going to be in church all day. Okay, we made it another Sunday. Ambitious people say, you know, I, I got to get more and more is out there more is not in here what you get in here today will be more than what you get at your job Monday through Friday so in Galatians 5 it says the acts of the sinful nature are obvious sexual immorality impurity debauchery idolatry and witchcraft and hatred discord so if I stopped right there all of you'd go I'm good I am so good. I am none of those. I, I'm not into witchcraft and idolatry. I don't worship anything but God. Hatred, I, I discard that. Now, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, and those who like who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Here's what we do in Christianity. We pick out the sins that don't apply to us. Oh, I'm good. I'm only doing one out of ten. That makes me in the top 10% of my rapture class. When the rapture comes, I'll be in the first load. If there's any room left in heaven and all the houses and construction's done, the person on the 10th that's doing 10 out of 10, that's how we look at things. We categorize. Well, I'm as good as or I'm better than. I worked harder than. The beauty of Christianity in heaven is... (laughs) It's based on his work, not yours. Now, it doesn't give you permission to be a sloth. If you read the book of Proverbs, the Bible says, The hand of the diligent shall rule. But I'm just saying, I have peace knowing I'm going to heaven, not because I'm good. Because there are days that I just look and go, I wouldn't even take me. (laughs) There are days I look and go, If I was God, I would just say, sorry. You were really an idiot on November whatever. But you know why I have peace? I'm going to heaven, and I'm going to move next door to people who hated me on earth. And I'm going to be the HOA president of my neighborhood. I'm prophesying. Oh, I don't know what's wrong. Oh, I know what's wrong. (laughs) Susan told me to tell you she's sorry she's not here today. (laughs) She is out of town. We're still deeply in love. She is the love of my life. And uh, (laughs) everything's good. And she wanted me to tell you women that starting in 2019, we're going to have this women's thing going on, this women's ministry thing. And she's really excited, okay? So you want to get ready for that. And then I'm going to do a men's mentoring thing, men's breakfast. We're getting ready to ramp it up in 2019. I'm telling you. I mean, hell is trying to create a defense plan right now. I am so excited. And, and I want you to get excited. I, I don't want you to go, I've got to go to church this Sunday. I mean, you know, pastor. I want you to get up on Sunday morning. I want you to wake up before the alarm. God would. I'm just asking God to do that. If the alarm's set for 7.30, I'm going to start asking God to wake up at 6.5. Oh, hold it. This is the 11 o'clock crowd. I'm praying that you wake up at 10. (laughs) Yeah. Then the last thing is this. Envy. Envy. This is so greed, it's all about me. Ambition is 
I need to get more because it's all about me. Envy is they have too much. This is where you'll lose your peace. And a friend of mine, some of you have heard the scripture, and I've, I've prayed it this way as well, I'm sure. I've, I have probably rearranged scripture more than a lot of you because I know a lot of scripture, and I've probably rearranged it to, to suit my need. Any of you ever do that? I, every now and then when I get mad at somebody, I'm thinking, God, here's what you said. <laughs> you ever do that? It's like smite them. You said you would. You ever done that? I've done that. I even still do that sometimes. <laughs> but I was, I was meeting with a, a, a pastor last week, and, and he, he's, he went through a really big ordeal about six years ago. And I was, I was there to try to comfort him, and not like Job's friends. I really try to comfort him. And, and so he was telling me last night, he said, you know, I was, I was in this really time of fervent prayer, and he said, God really spoke to me. This, this goes, connects to peace. He said, God really spoke to me, and he said, you know, you know the scripture, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I'll repay. I said, well, of course, I've prayed it numerous times. <laughs> All of us have who know that scripture and say, God, sick them. Get the German shepherds of heaven unleashed. And so he's saying, and this is where, I, you know, you kind of get humbled. I said, yeah, I remember that. I'm just kind of going along with it. And he goes, God spoke to me. He said, you know, because there were some painful things that happened to me. And he said, uh, yeah, he said, God spoke to me. And he said this. He said, you've misunderstood that scripture. He said, vengeance is mine. I'll repay. He said, what I'm telling you is I will repay you for everything that was taken. He's don't worry about them. Envy looks at other people and say they have too much they've done too much they, and he said no God said I'll repay you and your success will be a reflection of my hand on your life and that's how I will repay them and you I thought that sounded really righteous and holy and I liked it I thought I don't why should I think about anybody else getting repaid obviously if I just keep my focus on God I keep the peace and God says I'll handle it all and everything you lost I'll give it back to you Vengeance is mine, and I'm going to make sure you get what's yours. You don't have to make sure you get what's theirs. You don't have to make sure you get what yours. What's yours? God said, I'll take care of getting to you what belongs to you. But you can't get out of peace and give your peace up while you're trying to get that, which you think is going to bring peace, but it doesn't bring peace. You get it because you choose peace, and you'll have peace when you get it, and that way it will be joyful. I am so happy. I got to tell you all, I just, when I start studying messages, I get it twice as much as you, three times. First off, I get to hear it from God. I get to study. I get to preach it at 930, and then you get it at 11. And I'm telling you, you got both barrels today. As a matter of fact, it might have been a pump. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> I want us to have the best December ever. And I want to challenge you. You know, every year, preachers, churches, businesses, I mean, pastors, everybody, they say, January, gold city, January, what's 2019 going to be like? Why don't we set the table for 2019 in December of 2018? Why don't we do that? Why don't we not wait until January of 2019 to go, okay, now we're focused. Remember what I said. Church is a place that doesn't get you to heaven. It's a place that that brings heaven to the church. It's when we get in the presence of God, we come to the house of God, it brings a little heaven. I want to challenge you in the month of December to set your course now. People start going to church in January. For some reason, it's like a magical thing. Okay, in 2019, we're going to serve the Lord. Why wait until 2019? What if Jesus comes back December 13th? Your whole plan for 2019 is blown. So let's just go ahead and start 2018 get a jump on things. It's kind of like Black Friday. It's a whole month before Christmas, but you went and got a jump on it. I'm done. <laughs> you know, laughter is good medicine. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And sometimes every message takes on a little different twist depending on the crowd and the atmosphere and I pray that some of you don't think there was too much levity in the house today, but I've really had a good time.
And I promise you, you're going to be smiling all the way into about 238 this afternoon. I just wanted to shake it up a little bit and not give you an even number. What time did he say that was? 238. It's an afterglow. <laughs> Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your joy and your goodness, your mercy, your love, your grace, your peace, your forgiveness, your power, your strength. God, all that you bring to us, not just the person of Jesus, but God, you sent your son who was filled with everything we would ever need, want or desire. And Lord, I know that there are people that can't even laugh today because they're, they're so weighed down and burdened down with cares and worries that, and God, they want out from underneath them. They just didn't have the information how to get out from underneath them. I pray that in some way that this message today has lifted some of the weight, the burden, the worry, the fear off of everyone who listens today and those who will listen to the podcast in the days and weeks to come. Lift today, God, the cares of this world as we give them to you. Lift them, pull them off of us, God. With every head bowed, every eye closed, the greatest burden is this. What's going to happen to me when I die? What's going to happen? Is there a heaven and a hell? Is, is it real? And if there is a heaven and hell and it is real, are they really like I've heard? Is heaven this place of bliss and the radiance of God is what lights heaven and a hell where there is fire and weeping and gnashing are those real you don't have to worry about that today if you just simply call on the name of the Lord the Bible says you'll be saved your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and whenever you draw your last breath you'll be caught up and he said to the thief on the cross today you shall be with me in paradise that's our Lord and Savior today immediately but you get to choose. You say, well, I, I, I've, I've gone to church and, you know, everything in your life has been based on a feeling. On my worst day, there's one thing I know for sure. That I am born again. I am forgiven and that I am going to heaven. And it's not because I'm a good person. It's because he's an awesome God. And that even when I don't feel right and feel things that I want to feel, I go back to the truth of the Bible. That he is faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. If you've yet to do that, I want to pray a prayer. And those of you watching online, I want you to pray this with me and with these precious people in the house. I want to ask all of you to pray this with me. Say, Father God, thank you for sending Jesus, your only son, to bring salvation, to bring peace, to bring joy into this world. I want all of those. I want everything you have today, God. So I ask you to forgive me for my sin. I repent. I turn to you, and I trust in you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, look up at me. If you prayed that prayer, and those of you watching online prayed that prayer, I want you to do me a big favor. This will be the most powerful text you've ever texted in your life. Text the word SAVED to that number, 405 500 1310. Just text the word saved. Do it right now. And when you hit, after you type in saved, I mean, you've texted some really neat stuff, romantic things, and you've received some very romantic texts. But you have never texted or received a text this romantic in your life. When you say saved to the creator of heaven and earth, now their intimacy between you and God Himself. So please text that word SAVED to 405-500-1310. Okay, do that right now. At this time, we want to receive our tithes and our offerings. I want to read something to you I found um, that is really awesome. And, and these people are not leaving. They're not mad at me. They're not walking out because we're receiving an offering. They're workers, okay? So if you ever want to work and become a servant leader, you too can leave early. But I promise you, every one of them have already tithed and given. Oh, oops. Oops. Okay, listen to this. This is entitled, The Man Who Gave 90%. His name is R.G. Letourneau. It says, he was a Christian industrialist who dedicated his life to being a businessman for God. He was hugely successful. 
designing and developing his own line of earth-moving equipment. He was the maker of nearly 300 inventions and had hundreds of patents in his lifetime. As he succeeded financially, he increased his giving to the point where he was giving 90% of his income to the Lord's work. Here's what he said. I shovel out the money, and God shovels it back. But God has a bigger shovel than me. You may be thinking, I could give 90% too if I was a multimillionaire. Maybe so, but Letourneau didn't start out wealthy. You see, this time of year, we start budgeting according to what we want to do for others instead of how we want to honor God. Well, you know, we got Christmas coming up, man. We can't give to God, so we'll take the month of December off. Let's just hope God doesn't take December off. Ooh, 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 ooh. Where do we go with that? What I'm saying is this. The reality is, when we develop a God-first mentality, that takes us to that place of obedience where God says, they have trusted me. And he said, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him. And that means in every area, finances, relationship, forgiveness. In all your ways, acknowledge him. and He'll make your path straight. That means we trust in him first and foremost. And let me tell you this. I love you. I'm your pastor. And some of you may not like that, but you're here and you know I am. And today this may feel like a a correction. It's not. It's a direction that I am telling you that if we will start obeying God in every area of our lives as we learn and know what to do, it will change everything in our lives. You know, I'm at peace financially only because God cannot deny his word. And I give, and I tithe, and I, you say, well, you're a pastor. I, I, you know, I, I, almost every church I've been, I've been one of the top givers. I find ways to give because I have chosen that pathway, and God is always blessed. And I'm telling you, he wants to do the same for everyone on this earth. So today I want to challenge you to give. If you want to text to give, 405-546-2226. It'll set it up for you. You can do it. If not, get one of your kids. They'll help you. And, and this is the way I give. And so I, I gave last week when I was out of town. I texted when we got paid. I immediately texted to give because I wanted to get God first. And so put it, put it there first. So if you want to give by check or cash, there's an offering envelope in the seat back in front of you. You can fill it out, drop it in there, and, and that's great too. Or you can go home and give online at mosaicokc.church. Uh, I want to encourage you, though, this year, let's, I, want to, I challenged the 930 crowd. I, this was not a plan. But I want to challenge you to be in church the month of December. I want to challenge us to be the gift that God wants. God wants you more than he wants anything or anybody, anything else. He wants you. And so why don't we honor God the way we honor our job? You go there five days a week. I'm asking you to come to God's house one. Can we make that a priority for the month of December? Let's blow it out. Let's pack this place. Invite people. Say, why don't you, what do you want to give to God this year? Give him an hour of your time on Sunday. Give him an hour of all your week. Give him one hour. Now, okay, an hour 15. Because you didn't get here until 11, 18. I know. Anyway, so. Okay, good. Um, uh, uh, I should just go ahead and pass the buckets before. I, they're looking and going, I'm hungry. My tummy's growling. I get it. Okay, as they're passing the buckets, let me remind those of you that are here for the first time. Stop by our welcome kiosk, and we have a gift for you. It was really funny. I was out in the lobby between services, and, and uh, I saw two ladies out there, and they had mosaic mugs, and they, they weren't guests. They had their names written on them. And I, I looked, and I said, I love your mugs. And they said, so do we. I said, thanks for representing. And, and so they're really neat. We've got some other stuff in there as well. But it's, it's really something we just want you to remember us as you leave, go home, and uh, we want to remember you in prayer. So when you put... Welcome, you type welcome in. I pray that you, if you didn't, your first time, type welcome 51310, 405 51310. Just type in welcome. Let us know it's your first time here. We'd love to know that you were here praying for you and you can remember us, okay? So if the buckets have passed and it looks like the ushers are rumbling around getting her done, uh, why don't you stand to your feet if they've passed your aisle? And uh, we love you so very much. Next Sunday, You want to be here, I promise you.
You want to be here. All right, let's go out with a shout of hallelujah on three. One, two, three, hallelujah. Now the sun is full.